ladies and gentlemen. Please silence your phones and hush your babies. The show is about to start. I offer my personal welcome to this Nemo and Cole Conference Halftime Show. Ah, lovely. Candles. It's almost like I'm plugging a product. Here is my lovely candle. I shall light it and it shall illuminate. I'm going to put it on a candlestick, not hide it under a bushel. Um, kind of a candlestick just in the background there. So lovely. I'll try not to burn the book. Welcome to the Nemo Co. Conference Halftime Show. It is Sunday. This is session four or five. I'm surviving just about on some sleep. And uh, we shall see how we get on. But the thing you all really care about, the thing you're all here for, is Jesus, Joe, or Russell. So let's find out. Jesus, Joe, or Russell. Russell is storming ahead, and we'll come to the reason for that later. But he's on 54, Jesus on 36, and poor old Joe is on 5. He doesn't get quoted nearly as much uh, as he was back in the day. But uh, hi, everyone in the chat. Loads of people are saying hi, hi, hi. Hi, everyone. Uh, I should, for the next show, get someone in to properly monitor the chat and point things out. Um, but yes, I will do my best to throw uh, comments up there. But who's this in the corner? Who's this that I'm hanging out with today? It is Rebecca Biblioteca from the Mormonish podcast. Welcome, Rebecca. Oh, thank the you halftime so, show. so much. I have to ask you about your candle. Is that a mm -hmm. general conference scented candle? I'm not um, sure what that would smell like, but I well, wonder. Oof, I hate to think what that would smell like. I mean, <laughs> if, church, if church foyers are anything to go exactly, by, it will smell exactly. bad, that conference center. No, it is a candle from the Exmo Candle Company. Um, mm -hmm. I worked on it. Oh, will it focus? Yeah, there you go. It's called Opposition in All Things. Um, for everyone that sells, I get a percentage of the profits, which is really nice. And... Uh, a small business gets supported. They're hand poured. It's a little business based in Virginia, and uh, it smells great. Uh, it, it smells great because I wanted it to smell this way. So, I mean, I'm biased, obviously. But yeah, Excellent. there's a link for it in the description. Um, but how did you find that session of conference, Rebecca? You you didn't seem keen to watch. Well, as I told you, when you approached me with the idea of coming on your wrap up show, which I love, by the way, I said, only for you will I sit down and watch and take notes on a whole session of conference. I mean, sometimes I watch here and there, but it's very difficult. And I think a lot of your viewers and listeners probably feel the same to actually watch an yeah. entire session. So I did do it, but only for you, Nemo. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, we, we started actually with um, Iring conducting from the, the Porta Podium. Sisters, we welcome you to the Sunday morning session of the 194th Annual General Conference of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. President Russell M. Nelson who is viewing this session from home has asked me to conduct this session. There we go. So um, Nelson is at home again. So he was at home, then he was back, then he was at home, he's still at home, and he'll come back, I assume, to speak. Uh, and he might speak pre recorded or he might speak live. I'm not sure. Um, but people are pointing out in the comments Iring's sounding really slow now. He's sounding like he's slowing down yeah. a lot. Um, but the person who isn't slowing down and, in fact, who is charging ahead into their love for uh, President Nelson is Ronald A. Rasband. Um, what I'm going to do, I think the format, I've been trying to work this out with other guests. Uh, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through the slides, the points that I've kind of picked out. And then if there's anything I've missed that you've written down, I want you then to, to dive in with that and we'll kind of discuss the, the slides together. So... This one was all about words. It's all about how words matter a lot. So you're the perfect guest for this because you like words. You like words <laughs> you in like the written it. form, particularly, <laughs> don't you? Uh, so, yes, he, he talks about how much words matter and the words of the prophet matter. Um, Second, the words of prophets matter. Mm. Prophets testify of the divinity of Jesus Christ. They teach his gospel and show his love for all. I bear my witness that our living prophet, President Russell M. Nelson, hears and speaks the word of the Lord. 
And there's that thing that we were talking about just before we went on live with the show, which is this thing in the Utah accent of adding a T between an yeah. L and S. Neltson. Neltson. Yep, yes, that's so a Utah thing. Absolutely. People tell me in the chat what that's about. Yep. Um, but that's a very important thing he's just said, that, pro that the prophet speaks the words of the Lord. And that's kind of been the whole shtick of my channel is like, if that is true, then we should be taking what they say very seriously and we should be inspecting it very closely because that's a big claim. And so if it doesn't line up with what Christ himself taught, if it doesn't line up with the basic principles of being honest and truthful, if it doesn't line up with being morally good, uh, then that's a problem. Would you not say? Absolutely. Um, then the Lord is not perhaps a very nice person. But my thought on this, when he said the words of the prophet are important, I thought that he left out one word, and that would be the words of the living prophet are important. Yes. Because as we learned in a previous conference, unlike mm -hmm. classic comic books or vintage cars, the <laughs> words of prophets can be and should be ignored. They do not age well. So I believe yes. he was talking about the words of our living prophet. Mm -hmm. And after that, you know, it's all up for interpretation. Yeah, because that was Alan D. Haney who, exactly. who gave that lovely talk. Um, but he said, I bear my witness that our living prophet, President Russell Nelson, hears and speaks the word of the Lord. So yes, it's very clear. It's all about the living prophet. Mm -hmm. That's the, the key. Um, oh, right. We'll get to that in a moment. But let's talk about just how much he quotes Russell M. Nelson in this talk. But Nelson has a way with words. He has said, keep on the covenant path. One. Gather Israel, Two, let God prevail, three, build bridges of understanding, give thanks, nine, increase faith in six, Jesus Christ, take charge seven, of your testimony and eight, become a peacemaker. Nine, Most recently, he has asked us to think celestial. Ten, ten in the space of like 30 seconds. That's why Russell and Nelson is so far ahead because you've got Muppets like this just <laughs> quoting everything he's ever said. For, and saying he has like, a way with words. Go I on. feel like they get some kind of incentive. How many times they mention his name? Do you think some? But what would some it be? Little, I I don't know. Monetary, or they get to sit at the head of the table when they have their meetings with the fifteen. I don't know, <laughs> but I feel like there must be some kind of incentive to mention him as often as they do. And I agree with you. Um, I'm so glad that you parsed that out. Joseph Smith is just falling farther and farther behind. They do not quote him directly. They mention him in passing, but he's definitely on the downward trajectory. Yes, definitely. And I, I think what's uh, interesting here is someone pointed out that Nelson has a way with words. I think that's about as 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 that's about as realistic as when uh, yesterday one of the general authorities said, I love reading President Nelson's Instagram posts. It's like, oh, you don't. <laughs> you, you do not. Uh, but I think, I think Rasband wins the PBK award uh, are you familiar with the PBK award? No, Rebecca? what is we talked that? About this. It's, um, it was named by Doug Vincent, who's probably in the chat oh, somewhere. Oh, I love Doug. Um, and it's the Prophet Butt Kisser Award. Oh, so it's the okay. person who kisses up to Russell M. Nelson yeah. the most. Um, and they they win an award each session. And I think Razman's going to win the entire conference, yeah. um, unless Nelson self-quotes massively. Yeah. Uh, that's a lot of quotes of the Prophet there. Um but he he then didn't stop there. He was like, oh, okay, I was at a temple dedication yes. and I just couldn't shake the feeling that I needed to add some words to my um, to my prayer. So he instead added this. I sent certain words were missing and by divine design, they came to me in revelation and I inserted these words in the prayer near the end. May we think celestial, letting their spirit prevail in our lives and strive to be peacemakers always. Does that, I want to get your thoughts on this. Does that strike you as really weird where he says, may we think celestial, TM, um, and doesn't add the LY to the end? Yeah. Then says, letting thy spirit prevail. So he goes straight then into old, like middle to late English, sort of King Sorry. James English, Sorry. after using a very modern American phraseology of not adding the LY. Yeah, well, I feel like, you know, of Adjective. course, think celestial, you know, is mm -hmm. President Nelson's little word, right? And so is, much yeah. merch. I feel like after this conference, even more merch with the word think celestial. Mm -hmm. That was on my list of words. I had, let's see, ongoing restoration, covenant path, children of the covenant, um, think celestial. And I think there was one more. Anyway, I'm not as sophisticated as you are, but I do try to keep track when these are mentioned. So mm -hmm. when he said that he literally was awoken 
from sleep with an unsettled feeling, got out his, I'm assuming he also has a lighted pen like President mm. Nelson. I think they all probably standard have issue, probably. Yeah, I think it's standard issue for the apostles of the Q15 and, you know, wrote down the words. Um, first, something quoted directly from President Nelson, think celestial. And then, as you said, you know, started the king's 16th century king's english that thy spirit might prevail and then added the about, yeah exactly and then let god prevail yeah exactly and then added the thing about peacemakers so that's kind of it just kind of tagged on at the end so i don't know how that was received when they mm -hmm. read the dedicatory prayer but i'm sure everyone was very impressed and i didn't count this as three because i could have i just counted it as one okay but you could have gone well he's quoting nelson there three mm -hmm. separate ways mm -hmm. but think celestial was the the main one so i just i just left it there because this is going to be embarrassing enough for the church as it is just how much nelson's been uh quoted here um but then he kind of gets onto this whole thing about, you know, the words of the prophet matter to the Lord and us. Okay, fine. They do matter. And so we should, again, be critiquing them and making sure that they stack up. Um, and then we got this, which I predicted he would say the words, I am sorry. Uh, and he did. Let me suggest three simple phrases that we can use to take the sting out of difficulties and differences, lift and reassure each other. Thank you. I am sorry and I love you. Do not save these humble phrases for a special event or catastrophe. Use them often and sincerely, for they show regard for others. Talk is growing cheap. Do not follow that pattern. Yeah, Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and your PR department, do not follow that pattern. Your talk is becoming increasingly cheap because you never say sorry. Rebecca, what are your yeah. thoughts? Yeah, this? that... that Obviously, everybody, I'm sure, picked up on that. Thank you. That's very nice. Um, uh, and I'm turning it back on the church, of course, to say I love you. They do say that often, although there are usually massive strings attached to the I love you. Um, but the I'm sorry, it's very interesting that they would mm -hmm. tell the membership and people to say I'm sorry when they have formally declared we do not offer apologies. <laughs> we do not say we're sorry. So it's no, almost like said, the church doesn't counsel. seek apologies or give them. Yes. Sorry, Karen. Yeah. No, go ahead. Say it again. I think I was talking over you. No, no. So it was down there jokes that said the church yeah. does not seek apologies, nor do we give them. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, good advice for us, but I would turn it right back around on them and say some I sorry, I'm sorry would really go a long way. And there are many scenarios in which I think a lot of people are owed and I'm sorry. Yes. I would, and, and I think that's that it's telling that when um, the guy from Thoughts and Things and stuff, his name's just John Streeter, yes. um, when he did the fake apology for the priesthood ban. Exactly. So many people were hurt and they were hurt because they realized many of them that they needed it and that it was it it gave them that moment of healing and then to have that taken away from yep. them that's what hurt and that's a that's a difficult thing to swallow because they almost convinced themselves i'm sure many of them that, that the church doesn't need to apologize we'll just move on but then when an apology is given yeah. it sets that thing off in them and they realize oh no i did i did need that um and that's part of the brilliance of what jonathan streeter did was actually it woke a lot of people up to the fact that no no the church really does need to apologize at least that's kind of how i look at it yeah no that came to mind exactly when you said that for me too mm -hmm. because people have the attitude oh finally thank goodness you know i never said it out loud but this is so important and then mm -hmm. it was not real yes so um that was that was rasband did you have anything else on rasband before we before we leave Oh, I did pick up one thing at the end yes, when yeah. he was talking about Jesus, of course, because they all tend to end on that. And he said, I am a special witness of, and I was listening, and he said of him. He didn't say of the name of. So mm. to me, that was very interesting because, as we know, they now say they are special witnesses of the name of Jesus Christ. There's that little of the name. So we don't get confused and think that mm. they actually are walking and talking with Jesus. But he actually said he is a special witness of him. So. Well then, was it was it Cook or Anderson? Because I always get the two confused. Um, but it was one of those two who said, "I I know his face and I know I and I know his voice," and they said that quite recently. People in the yeah. chat, if you remember who that was, please let me know and I'll, I'll clarify. But that that's still happening. So you kind of have these two camps emerging. If they're oh. like, "Oh, we're the special witness of the name of Jesus, and we're going to step away," but then some people are still leaning in, yeah. um, and. This Rasband's clearly one of them. 
um, it's really interesting. And Peter Bleeker talks about there's a lot to see the different camps that form within the, the leadership of the church. Yeah, keep um, up guessing. I think that's the word. Keep I think up. so. Or it, it's almost so they can be all things to all people. Like to the people that want to believe they literally see Jesus, they've got examples of someone saying that things that could be construed that way. For people that want to move away from that rhetoric, they can also be that to them. You know? Yeah, no, that makes sense. That would be the generous reading of just how inconsistent they are between themselves. <laughs> I mean, it could just be complete uh, lunacy or whatever you want to call it. But yeah, yeah or someone didn't get the memo. Then now yes. it's just the name of. So. Yes. Well, Susan H. Porter. Oh yes. It was sweet, wasn't it? It was she, sweet. She spoke to primary children. It yes. was lovely. She um, did. Said, "How can you know that Heavenly Father is really there, even when you can't see Him?" This song gives the answer. Pray he is there. Speak he is listening. Okay, so we're setting children up now that praying and then paying attention to um, how you feel, because that's the thing she goes on to say next. That's en enough to give people evidence that something yeah. you can't see and don't know about, you can all of a sudden then say, I know. Yeah. And that's how we're setting people up to say they know things that they don't. And I don't have a problem with people believing things, but... I've said this a couple of times now, we really need to get away from saying we know stuff that we don't because it puts us in conflict with logic and with scientific method and all those sorts of things that we use to establish knowledge and fact. Talking about these things in the realm of knowledge and fact isn't helpful. We need to talk about them as what they are, which is beliefs, and that's fine. No, I think you're exactly right. She's using the word no incorrectly, mm -hmm. as often happens. It's not no, it's I feel. If mm -hmm. people could learn to say I feel, it would help them put more in perspective what they're trying to say. When you say I know, you expect others to know it too, or to be able mm -hmm. to understand what you're saying. A feeling you can own. It, it's your own mm -hmm. feeling, and that's completely fine. But yeah, I had that same take on this um, starting very young. It doesn't say study something out, try to get information, try to learn, try to mm -hmm. talk to others. It's simply says what do you feel you yeah. feel it and that's completely valid and that, go that means there. you know it yes that means it's you like, know it okay no that doesn't that doesn't work um and i I, th I think it's going to just continue to create problems but i think the reason it's done is because unlike what elder Ruckdorf was saying yesterday i don't know if you caught any of what we said about him but he was basically saying that if you feel like you're happy and you don't believe in god I honor those feelings and I understand that there are joys and pleasures out there and you can feel happiness. We're just saying we have something else to offer or something more to offer. And that's cool. That's a really responsible adult way of talking about your belief system versus someone who doesn't believe. But the general rule within Mormonism and what this talk is pointing to is there needs to be a monopolization of a worldview and an intolerance for people that don't share that worldview. Because ask anyone that leaves the church, it's difficult because it wasn't just that this is what you believed it's that this is what reality was this is the truth this is exactly how the universe operates is that you know mormon god elohim is there jesus christ did xyz and you know this it's not a belief system it's a knowledge of the state of things as they are and so when that falls apart it's much worse than just no longer believing something does that make sense? Yeah, no, that's exactly right. And and I think we all face that when people look at us having stepped away and you have that phrase, the light has gone out of your eyes. You're not truly happy. And then you get stuck in this trap where you're like, I am happy. Well, you don't sound happy. Well, that's because you're questioning my happiness. You know? <laughs> it's it's a lose-lose scenario, right? There's yeah. no way when you're, when and you understand the paradigm in the worldview. You explained it perfectly just now. It is the truth. It is your paradigm. And so you have to understand others are in that and they really understand honestly can't see another perspective until you do and then boy do you see it <laughs> but it, it just saddens me that talks like this are still perpetuating yeah. that kind of binary uh, yeah. thinking to children um, yeah and she's addressed here a theme that was being addressed throughout the conference and will get addressed by other speakers as well it's like what happens when you pray for something and it doesn't happen and it's there's there's still they explain to people how we can exist in this heads i win tails you lose scenario that um, the church always wins, the house always wins, God yep. always wins. Um, sometimes you may want to know why something hard is happening in your life or why you didn't receive a blessing you prayed for. Often the best question to ask Heavenly Father is not why, but what. So she's doing that thing, that typical thing of where it's like, let me change the question. It's like, no, 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 no. <laughs> like a Brad Wilcox, question? right? He's a so, master of doing that. <laughs> yes, it is a full Brad Wilcox <laughs> is, is like, 
instead of asking why, have you tried asking? <laughs> so, but no, no. Can we go back to the why? Because I'd like to know. Right. No, just move <laughs> past that because there's no good answer for that whatsoever. So yeah. Um, and then here she said, "Do you want to grow in patience or in honesty?" And I thought that's interesting because she's making very clear there that um, honesty still matters and should matter to children. I think that's really good. I think that's important. And I think that means that we have a right then to be upset when leaders of the church are not honest. Because at a primary age, those leaders are talking to primary age children mm -hmm. and saying honesty is an important thing that you should want to grow in. So it creates this massive hypocrisy um, that upsets many people. And there's a talk that we will come to where we're going to talk about losing trust in the church when people are dishonest and whatnot. But uh, I think... oh. Oh, yes, we'll get to this bit in a second. Yeah. Before we get to this bit, anything you've got from the talk? Because I've rabbited on quite a bit. Yeah, no, no, no. Very good points. Um, I think, you know, I spent a lot of time in primary when I was toward the end of my career in the church. I felt like mm -hmm. primary was an okay place to be. You know, I enjoyed working with the kids. I was a primary pianist. And then at the very end, I realized it was one of the most um, dangerous places to be because of this indoctrination of the very, very young, you know, and of course, the mm -hmm. honesty question there, they, they are telling them to be honest, but they're also leading them to believe that they will always be honest with them, the leaders and the teachers. And mm -hmm. that's not necessarily what is happening in that scenario. So there was some, there was some, there was a dicey side to what she was saying, I guess is yes. what I'm trying to say. And I, and I feel like a lot of conference, this session that I watched anyway, was all about the idea that what you want to happen probably is not going to happen. You're not going to get the miracle. You're not going to, and to kind of um, piggyback on your sort of gambling reference that you just made, I feel like the whole thing was sort of a sunk cost scenario, which means that you've already put so much into it. Don't leave. It's about to happen. Your mm -hmm. miracle is about to come. The answer is about to come. Don't leave now. And that's a gambling fallacy where you just put so much in you cannot walk away from the table the, the slot it, machine yes, is one pull yes. away from one pull and you see others winning you know and this was mm -hmm. also a theme throughout with her talk too you see others getting the miracle where's yours just wait long enough and it's a way to keep someone in forever mm. actually yeah well and that that's perfect segue into the next point i was going to make yeah. she talks about wanting her father to join the church and he never did throughout his entire life Oh, man. Okay. And a few people messaged me about this. So I really want to bring this point up. Yeah. Heavenly Father does not force anyone to make a choice. So she says that. And then five days after her father died, she received a sacred feeling of joy, possibly the realization that, hang on, I get to do this now. Yep. Heavenly Father let me know through his spirit. Okay. That's yep. questionable because it seems like that spirit is confirming exactly what you already wanted to happen, which I swear there's teachings from church leaders where they're like, you know it's the spirit when it's telling you to do something you don't really want to do. So how can it then also be the spirit when it's telling you to do exactly what you want to do? It's a win-win <laughs> either way. Yeah. Heads I win, tails you lose. Um, so that uh, the fa her father wanted to receive the blessings of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I'll never forget the day I knelt around the altar and temple. So basically God won't force anyone, but if you wait for him to die, you can just go and do it for them posthumously anyway. Yep. No, that's, that's, a, just that's silly. a big concept. No, I know. And I'll say, for example, my parents are avid genealogists. They always have mm -hmm. been. And they actually passed on a binder to family members in the church of people that they haven't passed away yet, or the family members that would disagree have not passed away yet. And once they do jump in there and do the work, which we know as soon as you pass away, you will understand that you were wrong and not wanting to be a part of this. And so do the work. So it's definitely a mindset out there that we know better what they want. Thunder Snows just said, but President Nelson mocked that friend of his who asked him to do the work for him in the next life. So which is it? Very good question. I don't mm -hmm. know about that story. I don't recall that moment. But if anyone can tell me about that story um, in the chat, that would be great. Uh, anything else about Sister Porter before we move on to Elder Rendon? No, I think we covered it. And we I do appreciate them good. having talks for children because I remember mm -hmm. being a child watching conference. You know, we were the family that was dressed in the Sunday clothes and had to sit, you know, every minute. So at yeah. least you made an attempt to speak to children in language that children could understand. So mm -hmm. I guess I appreciate that. <laughs> Just one, one more quick point about this whole posthumous um, work for the dead. It also kind of makes no sense because the the idea and the praise of faith in the church is that we don't know, we can't see, and yet we have faith and act, right? And that's what we're being patted on the back for. That's the hard work, and that's what we're going to get rewarded for in the next life. 
if someone dies, they're then confronted with knowing what's happened after they died. Say that they're around, they're alive, they're conscious, or you know, the, whatever state the body enters into, their spirit is floating around going, oh, okay, that's that big mystery solved. I now mm -hmm. know exactly what happens after I die. They're not on a level playing field anymore. They are very much in a different place making that decision then to join the church right. or, or take upon themselves those covenants or whatever. It's entirely unfair. Yeah. So you say, I from see it, it now. How do you not see it if you're faced there with everything you've been told is there? Exactly. Oh, I'm in spirit <laughs> prison. Kind yeah. of want to get oh, out of here. I get it. Yeah. Hello, missionaries. Excuse me. Can I have the missionaries? <laughs> Waiter. Wait, <you> know. <laughs> missionaries, please, right now. Thank you. Yeah. Thank there's, you. A, there's a line out the door of this you know, spirit prison baptismal yeah. font. Yeah. Um, but the church is, you know, saying uh, that this is the fair way because some people don't have a chance to accept the gospel or whatnot. But we don't ever think about the people that had the chance said, nah, you're all right their entire life. And then get to sit in spirit prison and go, well, I guess that was the case. The Mormons were right. It's like that South Park bit. It's like, oh, the Mormons were right. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, right. I'm going to go join them now. It actually, I, I've it's just come to me, but it's just weird. It is weird. Really and weird. I will say one more thing. I'm sorry. We're please. spending so oh, much please. time on her talk, but just the idea that they're even bringing up the subject that there are members of families that might not be part of the church. And I noticed that toward the end of my primary experience, that people would start saying to the kids, how many of you have family members that don't go to church? Number one, they ask the question. That's kind of shocking. And number two, almost every child raised their hand. So they definitely are addressing the fact that a lot of kids mm -hmm. are aware of family members, friends that have stepped away. That was not something I would say even 15 years ago with kids. You just didn't talk about it. And, mm -hmm. and no one had a family member that wasn't in. No, the demographics of the church are shifting yes. wildly and yes. quickly, I would say. Um, we have Renland, who who was quite uh, sort of amiable. He made some funny jokes about the size yeah. of the waves that were hitting him yeah. and, and stuff like that. And yeah, I, I think it, it was quite quite a deal withable talk. But then it soon soon turned into a, oh, you, you're not just constantly hitting your head against the brick wall that is Mormonism. Well, keep going, please. Thank yeah. you. Um by consistently paddling the kayak, I maintain momentum and forward progress, mitigating the effect of waves hitting me from the side. The same principle applies in our spiritual lives. We become vulnerable when we slow down and especially when we stop. And I wonder whether he's kind of having a bit of a jab at those that stopped going to church during COVID, obviously, and then didn't come back. He's like, oh, no, you've become vulnerable because you stopped. But actually, we are seeing the truth of this, which is that when people were given a chance to step mm -hmm. away from the church and just stop for a moment, Stop having to get their kids up in the morning. Stop having to, you know, drag, uh, iron everyone's clothes. Uh, I'm thinking particularly of women, actually, and a lot of the burden that was on women in that house. But, you know, men not having to go to all these meetings all mm -hmm. week. Men not having to get to church really early for all that sort of stuff. All of a sudden, people were able to just go, huh. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. What do I really want? And that, that, so the church has actually been weaponizing this idea of momentum and just keeping people moving. Um, just want to say thank you very much to New Name Adam in the chat for their donation. Thank you very kindly. And Keith says hi. Um, New Name Adam was the winner of a competition uh, I did right early in the days of the channel to have their own, very own horse. Um, so his name is Keith, named after Keith Erickson, a Mormon apologist. Uh, mine is called Daniel, named after Daniel Peterson, another Mormon apologist. Uh, who knows? Maybe one day I'll do another tapir competition. Uh, let me know in the comments if you'd like to see that. But Rebecca, what do you think on this idea of the church actually weaponizing this principle of sort of momentum? Yeah, no, I like this talk because uh, we've heard so many talks, uh, stay in the boat. And now we got stay in the kayak. It's a little spin on it. It's a little refreshed, mm -hmm. I think, a reboot. So I did appreciate that. But but no, you're absolutely right. He used the phrase, I wrote it down here, forward spiritual momentum. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly it. You cannot rest for a second. And it made me think of a conference I went to with the wonderful Stephen Hassan, you know, cult mind control. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he talked about how he was involved in, in a cult for, you know, quite a quite a bit of time until then an injury took him out he was at home resting it was sort of an intervention but again not having to perform the tasks and the things and all the momentum of the cult as soon as he put a stop to it his brain sort of rewired and he could clearly see what he was doing mm -hmm. so i do not blame the church for telling people that they cannot give up one iota 
they cannot stop that forward progression one second. Because if anybody has a chance to stop and think, just naturally as human beings, we will sort of relax and ask ourselves, what are we doing? Why are we doing it? You know, it reminds me of a talk, oh my gosh, decades ago, because I've been mm -hmm. in the church for five and a half decades. And it was when church was in the morning and in the evening. I don't know if a lot of your viewers or listeners know this, but this is how it used to be. Oh, before, before the consolidated program. Before yeah. the consult, before the gas crisis in the 70s that meant you couldn't drive back and forth. They had to consolidate it. But there was a talking <laughs> conference where they told this horrible story of a family that did go to church in the morning, but then they dared to go on a picnic in the oh. afternoon. They went to the lake how instead of going they? back for afternoon church. And it was the same idea, this freedom of going to the lake Soon the family went to the lake all day long and soon the family, you know, never came back. So there are all of these cautionary tales and I understand why they do it because the lure of the lake is strong, right? Metaphorically. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but the, the lure the of a peaceful, <laughs> the, the lure of a peaceful Sunday morning was yes. also. That's what I'm saying. Metaphorically, yeah. the lure of anything peaceful, anything different. And you're right about moms. I mean, I always, people say, why did you leave the church? I'm like Sunday clothes, Sunday clothes for boys. I have all boys and getting them there in their Sunday clothes. This doesn't fit. Where's my sock? Where's my, it's a, a nightmare. As much as I would try to get everything ready, because you had to have them all perfectly lined up, you know, in their Sunday clothes, I couldn't do it. And I finally gave up and that was it. Sunday clothes yeah. drove me out. I think just the, the last point on this, I think what, what, um, what Renlund's saying is the quiet part out loud, which is he's acknowledging yeah. that if people do stop, they yeah. will leave the church. Yeah. Um, but for some of them, they find that that's actually a good thing. Um, for others, not so much. Yeah. Right. Um, this, I felt like he was getting a little bit, a little bit but hurt, bit bit upset that you know people are calling out the leaders of the church publicly. He's like, no, no, no. If you're going to to say things, notice how he didn't say anything in front of the group. He he came and corrected me quietly. Well, I tried doing that through my priesthood leaders, and Dallin Chucks yeah. fobbed me off. So um, yeah. public it is. Uh, thank you very much to Rock Monster Lord. <laughs> What are your thoughts? Did you get that vibe from that or did you see something else in it? Because if you did, I'd love to hear. Yeah, no, I had that thought when you said don't correct publicly. We can't correct anyone. We can't write a letter anywhere to anybody that will respond. I have to laugh on my podcast, Mormonish. We kind of do a temple watch where we work with mm -hmm. the residents in Cody, Wyoming, Heber Valley, Utah, and now Lone Mountain, Nevada, as temples are being built there. And the residents are trying to say, please don't change all our codes. Please mm -hmm. don't, you know, take over our city councils. Please build the temple somewhere where it's appropriate. And one of them asked me yesterday in Lone Mountain, he goes, so I want to kind of start a letter writing campaign to the leaders in Salt Lake and to the church. Where would I address that letter? And I'm just like, oh, dear. Oh, you poor dear. You know, mm -hmm. There's no way to do that. You just don't understand. So, it, so it, when I started my change.org petition uh, to leaders of the church, which I think it's got a couple of thousand signatures. Um, I was like, yeah, I'll, I'll make this petition to say, you know, can we use can we use tithing funds um, exclusively for humanitarian work? Let mm -hmm. people redirect their tithing funds to humanitarian work. Um, that would be great. And uh, it says at the end, you know, how, who are we delivering this to? I was like, I don't know but I mean I have the email addresses of the 12 so I just put yeah. those in <laughs> so it'll go straight to their inbox uh thank you very much to Doug Vincent as well for um jammy dodgers mm -hmm. are are you aware of the jammy dodger thing no that looks amazing oh, oh my goodness right jammy dodgers these are <laughs> shortbread biscuits with a raspberry jam filling oh my gosh no that I love yeah. shortbread oh that looks incredible oh my yeah, goodness so these keep me alive during uh conference that and uh this is a nice amazing. segue thank you very much Doug and everyone else that has contributed <laughs> um if you want to keep me stocked up with jammy dodgers if you want to keep the work that i do moving way past the conference weekend up to next conference in all the way in october uh, i do regular analysis of church talks and church statements uh on my channel weekly at uh 8 p.m uk time 1 p.m utah time uh every week so become a regular monthly donor at the link in the description it will keep me in with the jammy dodgers and keep me doing this full time which is is what i do full time um and it's great and it's tiring and it's wonderful and it's it's lots of different things um but i wouldn't do anything else so let's and move you're on so to good at it let's add that oh, you're oh, so no, no. good well, at it no, no. I, <laughs> let me be clear i'm not asking for your money and your support and your likes and subscriptions because i think i'm good at this uh it's just it's the hopes that you won't realize i'm not very good at it and you'll just support me anyway that is <laughs> that is not. what is going on here um 
well, exhibit A, most people who are struggling know that they're struggling, this guy. Um, we should not be judgmental. Our judgment is not helpful or welcome and is most often ill-informed. Um, again, that felt a bit pointed. Like, you don't know us. You don't know what we're dealing with. It's like, well, I know the standards that you're judging me by, so I uh, judge not lest you be judged. You'll be judged with that standard that you judge others. I forget what those scriptures are. But essentially, that's idea, right? I, I only judge them by the standards by which they judge me and by which the church taught me to live. Basic standards of honesty, decency, basic ethics. And they're just not doing it. They're, they're lying and they're stealing money and, and misappropriating tithing funds and putting it in places where they uh, shouldn't. So um, I don't think it's particularly wrong of us to hold them accountable, but they seem to think so. What are your thoughts? No, and you hear a lot of people who have left say, you you taught me to look for truth. You taught me to do this. You taught me to think this way. You taught me to be moral and upright and to you know stand by my convictions, to have integrity. You taught me this with lip service, you know, and, and I did that. And then I had to turn and look at you and I had to leave. And, and I hear a lot of people saying that you taught me this. Yeah. And I feel like it's the next talk actually that will, will kind of cover this idea of faith. Being lost. I've still got half a mouthful of jammy dodger, but it's traditional. <laughs> oh, I have I to eat did. one. Oh my gosh. That looks amazing. <laughs> I have to eat one during every halftime show. So, um, eat one for me. <laughs> yeah. So, Ice guy in the comments is saying you're taking this out of context. I think maybe he's talking about this quote. It isn't within its full context. If you want it within its full context, go and watch the talk. But he is talking about more broadly how we should interact with one another. Mm -hmm. What I'm doing is I'm taking that and making it a bit meta and saying, but on a larger level, yes. it feels as though they're also saying, hey, don't judge us. Right. And I'm just pointing out that we have every right to. That's what's going on there. Right. Ice guy, hope that makes sense. Um, and my accent didn't make it sound too patronizing. Let's go to Paul B. Piper. And this is anything I missed about Renland. Is there anything you've got that I missed, Rebecca? No, nope. I think just, you know, again, a huge focus on covenants in every single talk. Covenants, yep. covenants, covenants, covenant path, covenants, covenants, covenants. Mm -hmm. <laughs> covenants, covenants, covenants. And yep. and uh, we will keep getting that throughout the rest of the, the message. But um, this here. If this isn't secretly um, what is felt by every person that leaves the church deep down at some level, he's kind of spoken to it. I, I don't know. He says, the challenge is that we live in a fallen world and have all experienced a loss of trust in others because of dishonesty, manipulation, betrayal, or other bad behavior. All of that, yes, count. all of that applies to the church. The church has been dishonest, manipulative, betrayed people's trust. And just behave badly. Once behaved, we find it hard to trust again. Yes, that's why people don't come back to the church. Sometimes negative trust experiences with imperfect mortals, they're trying to play the, oh, we're just imperfect people card, affect our ability and willingness to trust Heavenly Father. Because he was in this talk, I don't know what you think, it seemed very much he was trying to be like, oh, no, no, just make it all about Jesus. Don't worry about all the people that get in the way. Just, just trust Jesus and don't let these people get in the way. But the problem is, throughout this conference even, even just two talks ago with Rasband was saying that the words of the prophet are the words of the Lord. Exactly. So how are we meant to differentiate? You can't say that imperfect mortals um, shouldn't affect our ability and willingness to trust Heavenly Father if they claim to speak for him. That's That doesn't work. So they they have to be of a standard that we would place on Heavenly Father if they're claiming to speak with those words. No, and you can't have it both ways. It can't have like. it both and, ways. and that's why it's funny when you when I see the quote now, I listened, of course, but to see it like this is just funny because the end where it says the willingness to trust and then it says Heavenly Father, you're like, wait, we were talking about Heavenly Father? No, mm -hmm. I, I don't think we were. That's not who I don't trust. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> it's, it's, it's not him. It's very often not deity people have a problem with. Exactly. Um, that's why I prefer the, the term trust crisis to faith crisis. Mm -hmm. because, um, and, and if it's not your experience, tell me in the chat, because I can't obviously speak for everyone. But my feeling is that for a lot of people, it's very much that they lose trust in the church as an institution mm -hmm. and trust in those leaders because they realize that they've lied to them rather than them going, oh, I don't trust an omniscient God anymore because like, well, you could kind of always trust an omniscient God to an extent because how are you, how, how would you not? Because in, in theory, if you believe an omniscient God wants the best for you, then 
anything that happens will ultimately be for your good in theory because he's playing 5d chess above your head yeah, exactly with your life then, right yeah. but once it comes to the leaders you're like well no these are men that claim to speak for that god and they've just not been honest so yeah well and it's an easy justification from leaders we don't know why and they've said this over and over but but god <laughs> we don't know mm -hmm. why you know he, but, but he's god. the one that's you know shunning you or excluding mm -hmm. you or he's the one that may just make this policy we don't know why but god and so again, negative trust experiences with imperfect mortals affect yeah. our ability and willingness to trust in God. When they actively blame stuff on God, like the priesthood ban, yep. you're like, well, okay, so yeah. you are definitely guilty of giving negative trust experiences that affect someone's ability and willingness to trust Heavenly Father, because you're poisoning the well against Heavenly Father by going, well, he's the yeah. reason that black people can have the priesthood for so yeah. long, we had nothing to do with it. No, and I don't know that people are falling for that anymore. Speaking of the priesthood right. ban, I attended, I think it was in 2018. It was not that long ago. Um, it was called a B1 concert where they had a big presentation concert in the conference yeah. center. Um, uh, Gladys Knight and her gospel choir it was incredible. The All the Q15 were there. It was to celebrate the lifting of the priesthood ban, you know, and it was a mm -hmm. packed house. It was amazing. And it was going really well up until toward the end when Oaks got up there and he started talking, you know, and he was saying some things and then he basically said we don't know why god did this to you you know and it, it was an it. audience with ethnicity and you could yeah. hear you could hear a you know i mean there was a palpable like what did he just say you know he said mm -hmm. it out loud he's still saying it even in you know 2018 so yeah it doesn't necessarily fly anymore to blame sorry god yeah but I think I think it's it's you could have just stopped when you when you said and it all went wrong when Oaks got up. I could have. I could I just had to go that little bit farther. You're right. Because <laughs> generally it all just does go wrong when <laughs> Oaks takes the stand. Um <laughs> generally speaking. But yeah, this is how I would sum up Paul B. Piper's like it doesn't keep people from trusting God, it keeps people from trusting you, the church. Yeah. That's that's what actually is going on there. Yeah. Um then we got some weird circular reasoning similar to Oaks's. You get a testimony by bearing testimony. It's like sometimes the best way to trust God is just to trust God. It's like, mm -hmm. hmm. makes sense. It's perfect. Okay. <laughs> right. So that doesn't sound like sort of blind faith at all, or, or you know, all these people writing books that faith is not blind, etc. I'm like, well, this seems to be advocating blind faith here yeah. is just trust God because yeah. trusting God will make you trust God more. Yeah. Which, but then yeah. a lot of the rest of the talks were all about uh, God won't do anything that you want him to do. He's not going to give you the miracle. He's not going to give you yeah. the escape route. He's not going to comfort you. And you just have to just put up well, with that. Because he was talking him. about trust falls, wasn't he? Yes, exactly. And basically this entire conference has been like, well, you might, God might catch you. He might not. Exactly. And so he's That's like, right. no, sometimes you just got to learn to trust God by trusting him. It's like, but what if he actually doesn't catch me? Yeah. And, because that's how the talk started with the example mm -hmm. of that, you know, that faith promoting game that you play in the workplace yeah. where, you know, you have to fall backwards and trust that someone will catch you. Yeah. It's pretty much, he may or may not, but you still need to trust him. It's for, if he lets you fall, it's for your good. So he yeah. wins every time. It's, it's amazing. Nothing makes God sound like a narcissist more than these situations in which he just always wins because it's always our fault or it's always yeah. not his fault. Correct. Um, and, and I don't like framing it like that because I know it upsets people, but that, that sort of that's what gives off the narcissist vibes is like well everything is my, our fault it's never yeah. on god yep yeah. you have to look inward that's what they mean by look, look inward point the finger of blame inward yes and then uh here we had this lovely anti-internet quote when our knowledge and understanding are inadequate we naturally look for resources to help us in an information saturated world there is no shortage of sources promoting their solutions to our challenges I don't know, that just felt a bit pointed. Yeah. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I thought so. I thought he was going to take it further. I thought, okay, mm -hmm. here we go. Here's our internet warning. But he, he didn't really take it too much no. past this. But definitely sort of a hidden message that I'm guessing as this talk circulates later, they can use that as a springboard to an entire conversation about use only trusted sources and things like that. So yeah. a lot of these talks are like that. They have these little kind of nuggets in there that then can later really be focused on and spun out into mm -hmm. something else. Um. And then here is again, this thing is like, therefore, we can be sure that whatever trust we may have demonstrated in God in the past, another trust stretching experience lies yet ahead. It's like, oh, so you thought you were settled and comfortable with God? Yeah, no, he'll he'll make it difficult for you again. 
Yeah. And, um, and that's a way of warning somebody like it is going to come. It, it is. Yeah. Winter is coming. So Winter's don't coming. leave. We already told you it was going to happen. So here it is. Just endure. Now, any, anything else about him before I start? Nope. I think that was that was good. I will make one comment. Oh, here he I'll, goes. I'll put the flag away. Carry on. Go, go, go. go. Did you go. notice just everyone in general, starting with the first speaker, they were already teared up when they took the stand. They almost to have, seemed, everybody seemed to have very red, teary eyes, I, uh, even before they started speaking. That dry Utah air. Yeah, that's what I was wondering. Or is there some kind of pink eye infection going through the core, you know, going through the leadership? <laughs> I don't know, but it, it was kind of distracting. And I was watching on a very big screen. Yeah. So it was really obvious, like tears okay. and sort of, I don't know. I can't I'm, say I'm I noticed. Now. <laughs> Maybe they're all crying at the fact that they know that Iring's about to die because he oh. does not seem well. Yeah, like, I, I'm be. not trying to be flippant about that, like genuinely. No, you know, I think one of them gave him a meaningful look, right? Yeah. Yeah. No, no and I got that from the first speaker, you know, when Iring introduced, it was like he did. He seemed very already extremely emotional. They were I think yeah. they are all very emotional. The top leadership is well, getting older, perhaps declining. Yeah. And that means it's the mad scramble to the top. Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, it, it's like they are a brotherhood in that sense. Yeah, you know, exactly. they and, and they are the bubble. Yeah. So. They are, you know, they're all together. They, they're they basically the only people that they really see apart from yep. their spouses and, yep. and other minions. So, oh, yeah. they, of course, they care for each other. Yeah. Um, someone said, how does um, pink eye transmit? Maybe they're all sharing binoculars when they're out bird watching or That's something. Um, but anyway, <laughs> rule Britannia and all that, right? Patrick here oh, and we had there he is. our countryman was uh, getting up and, and sharing uh, his thoughts um, but before we say any more about his thoughts, he was Good called to singing. We will hear from Elder Patrick Karen, who was ordained an apostle and set apart as a member of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles on December 7th, 2023. Yeah, so... Um... That's not right. He shouldn't have been in that position until he was sustained by common consent. Correct. Um, so now he's acting legitimately, but uh, from December through to April, he wasn't acting legitimately according to scripture. And I've gone over that in previous videos. Um, and then we have uh, Ladrak just sent a little chat saying, uh, Kieran had a rare conference joke that was yep. genuinely funny. Behind every new apostle stands an astonished mother-in-law. Mother-in-law jokes <laughs> are... They are, they are the key to British humour in many ways. I don't know if they translate over the pond as well. Um, but they clearly did because the conference centre enjoyed it. Oh, God save the king. Just put that up there. Yeah. Um, the conference centre clearly enjoyed it. Uh, because it not only was it a mother-in-law joke, it was actually a dead mother-in-law joke. And people seemed to laugh at the fact that she wasn't alive. Exactly. No, that's my first note here. Actual funny joke. Yeah, that's what I wrote down. It really was. It was genuinely. It wasn't that kind of awkward conference laughter, you know, <laughs> that we mm -hmm. all hear. That's so creepy. No, this was, you know, I laughed right along. It was very funny. Makita Johnson is saying that red eye comes from watching Rome burn while Nero fiddles. Oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> just, um, yeah. Oh, hang on. Someone's before we go any further with Patrick Kieran. Someone's questioning Jamie Dodgers. Um, oh. How are you supposed to eat these dodges without them exploding into powder like a Nature Valley bar? Do you jam and dodge the whole thing in one bite like a psycho? Um, do I need a hot drink with it? Well, this is how it's done. These are the burning Just, questions of the day. These are, yeah, can... let's pause our conference commentary for a second. <laughs> exactly. um, well, I'll get you here. Everything about the father's plan for his children is designed to bring everyone home. Mm, incorrect. He kicked Lucifer out for that suggestion. Oh, no. Luce, Lucifer was like, I'll bring everyone back. And he's like, no, I want I want Jesus the gambler to be like, well, some might, some won't. But as long as God's praised, it's all chill. I want you to talk about this while I show the commenter how you eat a jammy dodger. American oh, Durak, you take a jammy dodger all in one go. I can't focus to even talk while I'm watching you eat it. There it is. Okay, his mouth is full. Nope. My whole thought on this talk, and I was looking forward to it because this is his like inaugural address. And as you said, when he finally is apostolic, he has the authority. He's been ratified. So I even wrote it down. The father's plan is not about roadblocks. Although there are so many freaking roadblocks. <laughs> I mean, if we start listing them now, we could go for another hour. But in his mind, he does seem to see there are not any roadblocks. Although 
I very much question that. It's a nice sentiment, but I don't think completely accurate. Yeah, Peter um, from Mormons of Wars, like Patrick did universal salvation doctrine, totally apostate, but juicy. <laughs> and I, I, my gut tells me this is sincerely what Patrick Kieran believes. And yeah. if the church survives until he's prophet, we would see a more universalist church, provided he doesn't com become corrupted by uh, the opinions of those above him. Um, and I noticed how this talk, he got very gravelly, didn't he, with his voice? He, he got did. very, and it was. It, it was nice. Uh, he's got a good voice for speaking yeah. of a PR. His his profession is in PR, uh, public relations. He ran a public relations firm here in the UK. So he's used to speaking. He's used to making people laugh. He's a very natural kind of communicator. So all of that is is excellent. Um, I don't know really what else to say to him uh, about this talk other than, yeah, I did disagree with him on this point that you can't say everything about the father's plan is designed to bring everyone home when the father was presented with a plan that literally would have brought everyone home and he decided not to go for it. <laughs> That's it. You said it. We don't even need to say any more. That really need to go any further on that one. Oh my um, God. I think I do have a video here to play though, uh, which I've been slow to put the video files up. So. Um... Yeah, I agree with you though. I think he seemed like he sincerely believed it. He really did, mm. you know, think that it was a kind and gentle father that does want to make it possible for everyone. Yeah. And I don't know if he thought through all the stumbling blocks and the things that are put, I mean, literally a cup of coffee will keep you out. Something as yeah. small as that. So I don't yeah. know if you thought that through. It's a nice sentiment. But yeah, no, absolutely right. We could, we could sit and, and, and go on those roadblocks yeah. because the roadblocks, particularly it, there aren't any roadblocks provided you, you are straight and yeah. before 1978, you were white and yeah. Yep. you know all these sorts of things smooth sailing so yeah that was smooth sailing and yeah. and I, but i think his genuine thought <clears throat> my voice just cracked there his genuine thought was that um or is that with enough changes to the church it doesn't need to be about roadblocks um it can it can actually be smooth sailing i think he sees that as what it should be like and i think he sees a church that isn't like that and i think hopefully under his leadership we might see things start to change um but then we went to Brian K. Taylor. And <laughs> his eyes were very red. I have to say, yeah. very red. <laughs> I'm yeah. sorry I'm harping on that. It was just so That's weird. Right. <laughs> That's right. Well, when, when we get the newsroom come out and say, yes, there was a, a case of pink eye, we'll know it's because you've raised I'm the prophetic. alarms. That's right. Yeah. Um, but he, he summed up, Brian K. Taylor summed up a lot of what's been said in this. Uh, conference which is why do some receive their yearned for miracles quickly and others continue to mm -hmm. wait patiently upon the lord that is the key question no yep. one has an answer for it no nothing in this conference has actually given a really good um answer for why some prayers are answered and some aren't so i don't think we need to circle that toilet but brian k taylor to his credit quoted two women yep. quoted two women how progressive it's 2024 um he quoted Two thirds of the total amount of women that actually spoke at this conference. Um, if my predictions have all come true, yes, yeah, Dennis Spanaus and Porter, three women speak at this conference, and he's quoted two women, Linda Reeves, and he quoted, well, yeah, he paraphrased President Camille and right. Johnson, um, which I just thought was really worth worth pointing out because that feels fairly historic because women are not quoted very often at all um to my to my recollection and i've been following conferences for the past in the past three years i would say women are not very often quoted at all um so yeah should we get to down late jokes yeah i was going to say one more thing about his Please. talk yep. um it definitely was a sunk cost analogy again talk you just need mm -hmm. to stay in you may not be getting what you need you may not have anything happen that you think needs to happen. You may be praying your heart out. Nothing's happening, but please, please remain in because it's just about to happen. And even if it doesn't, it's okay. I mean, it was one of those talks. The other thing I thought was interesting is he, he referred to, you know, maybe people who don't have faith and how, I don't, I, I call it the, the frightened atheist syndrome, right? Anybody that doesn't have this faith or trust in God, mm -hmm. when things happen in their life, 
they're confused, they're frightened, they don't know uh -huh. how to frame them. And I actually find the opposite true. I find people who no longer have that religious construct, you know, and they have trials, they just look at them and they say, oh, here's a trial. Interesting. I'm going to see what happens. I'm not begging or relying on any kind of otherworldly power. You know, I'm going to take comfort in human beings, in people, mm -hmm. in society, and I'm going to try to power through. So I thought there was a little bit of that, you know, frightened, scared atheist mm -hmm. to his talk. But again, it was just, please, please stay in. It's about to happen for you. Mm -hmm. And we had some of that in the previous session where someone brought up Corihor and how Corihor at the yeah. end goes, oh yeah, no, I always knew there was a God. Yeah. Right. And it's just, that's why everyone's parents still thinks that deep down, they still believe if they leave the church, their exactly. parents are all like, oh, well, like Corihor, they'll just come back. Yeah. They must be terrified. Whereas I find comfort in randomness. Honestly, mm. I really do. Well, just accepting mm -hmm. uh, that you have no control. And that's why uh, Jane put this really well uh, in one of the sessions that we did yesterday about Gong's talk, where Gong uh, gives this Taoist idea um of you know a man gets a horse uh mm -hmm. and he says oh what good fortune then his son falls off and breaks his leg oh what bad fortune son doesn't go to the military because he's got a broken leg oh what good fortune etc etc yeah. and the moral of that story actually is that the world is random it ebbs and flows good things happen bad things happen yeah. and we should remove ourselves from being upset or invested in when good things or bad things happen and we should just allow them to be and i think that's kind of what you're describing right is that idea yeah. that okay well um rather than atheist melts down because life has no meaning, et cetera. It's like, well, actually, because life from the atheist perspective is random and chaotic, then you don't get bothered by the fact that things seemingly unexpected um, are, you know, are happening. Um, exactly. Billy Klaus says, for those of you in Utah who want to try Jammy Dodgers before the final live stream, <laughs> you can get them at the world market. Oh. Uh, and as a note, they are, in fact, excellent. Thank you very much, okay. Billy Klaus, and thank I'm you for the donation. There. I'm going um, there. <laughs> but now someone is saying Jammy Dodgers are the devil's cookies. JB, I don't ban many people from the comments, but that is a warning. <laughs> <laughs> Kidding. Um, let's totally get, on to, get some. This is let's amazing. get on to Dalla Lake jokes um, right now. Oh, so personal commitments are essential to the regulation of our individual lives and to the regular right. functioning of society. Um, in fact, you know what? I think I've got him saying it. So let's just put him yeah. saying it. Uh, cause this is one of those where I was like, oh, I'm not sure I've actually got this right, writing it down. So, oh no, we've done Jesus Joel Russell. Yeah. All right. It's, it's not what we wanted. <laughs> where, why did that? It's coming up. Yeah. He definitely focused on covenant responsibility again. I mean, everybody did. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you could parse out how many times that word was said or covenant path, the whole theme of the conference, I believe, and Oak sewed it up very well was, but you promised right? Mm. You promise. This is very strange. <laughs> we'll just um, run through everyone again. Oh, here we go. Here we go. Are essential. I think what's happened is as I was chopping up talks, yeah, they've all just ended up in one file. 2023. Oh, so a covenant is a commitment to here fulfill certain responsibilities. Personal commitments are essential to the regulation of our individual lives and to the functioning of society. This idea is currently being challenged. A vocal minority oppose institutional authority and insist that persons should be free from any restrictions that limit their individual freedom. That seems like a straw man. Yet we know from millennia of experience that persons give up some individual freedoms to gain the advantages of living in organized communities. Right, so I want to get your thoughts on that, but I just want to answer a quick question in the chat. Um, no last name said, maybe I missed this, but how do you know all the speakers ahead of time? Well, it's a very simple process. You you take a hat like this, it's a Thrive hat. Um, you take a, a rock, a stone, whatever, you pop it inside mm -hmm. and, and just and, and like that. That's... That, that's, that's how it, how it works generally <laughs> oh, well. not working for me uh, mine's special salt lake granite it's the stuff that nelson made his tombstone out of it's uh pretty good quality seer stone anyway um what did you think about oaks and this oh, idea yeah. that covenants are essential and that we agree to give up some freedoms yeah. to live in a society and it's all, all right 
Yeah, no, it's important talk and they give it every every year. And again, it's the you promised talk. Yeah. And to me, okay, when I was growing up, they sort of said baptism, that was a promise. But boy, in the last three or four years, baptism, what you did when you were eight years old, you are mm -hmm. absolutely bound by that. And not only baptism, they're now taking it back to the pre-mortal existence. You were yes. valiant, you promised. So there's all these steps where you are making these covenants. But I was thinking about this idea of covenants and mm -hmm. covenanting is almost a third party covenant. You're making a promise and you've been told by a middleman that mm -hmm. God, Heavenly Father is going to, you know, go ahead and and be part of that promise. You don't really know that. I mean, I guess you're told to pray, you're told to sort of arrive at it at yourself, but it really is a middleman. Hmm. If I do this, someone has told me, the church has told me that if I do everything yeah. in the church, that God will reward me in this way. You know, has God told you that? I guess that's where personal revelation comes in. And yeah. this talk I also felt was a little bit of a jab at everybody out there who feels that personal revelation, of course, most recently garments, right? Mm -hmm. People are saying, I, I feel personally that I can, I can keep my covenants by doing it this way. This was sort of a jab against that, right? No, no, no. Mm -hmm. Covenants, the way we frame them, you know, supersede your idea of personal revelation. So it mm -hmm. was an important talk in that way. Yeah. Um, someone's just sent $2 for the white top hat fund for October. Um, maybe I'll get even more spicy things there um, if, I, if I can get myself a white top hat. But um, I think to your point, this quote here where he said, the practice of covenanting with God or religious leaders, he snuck that in. Covenanting yeah. with God or religious leaders yeah. is also recorded in the Book of Mormon. Yeah. Da, da, da. It's like, okay, so actually, who am I covenanting with? Am I covenanting with God or am I actually covenanting with you, Dallin? Yeah. Is that what's That's going true. on here? Yep. Yeah. Um, and, and this links back to Bednar's talk where he talked about how, no, no, Jesus isn't the foundation. He's the rock. And the thing that sits yeah. between you and Jesus is yours truly so uh you better fund that hadn't you give us your money um so the idea that actually it's the church it's that middleman like you mm -hmm. said it is the church yeah. of the middleman they they do exactly what satan said he would do which is like no okay i'm gonna make everyone do exactly what i want and that means everyone gets back and i will be between them and getting back whereas jesus was meant to be walking alongside people and taking them back exactly there's the the difference there so he yeah he conflates leaders with God which is problematic and then yeah also you said um, Revelation given in April 1830 he talks about how um, when people enter into the, um, they enter into the covenant path or whatever by baptism they enter into a covenant relationship it's like well at eight years old yeah exactly and that's what you're then bound to for the rest of your life. Or before you even had knowledge in the pre-mortal existence. I've heard this pop up too. And unfortunately, how do you fight that? No, I didn't. No, I didn't want to, but you did. And you mm -hmm. have to. And that's why they say the word, as soon as they said that word covenant path, you probably picked up on it too. It was several years ago. I'm like, oh, here's the new word. Whoever came up with that was brilliant. Here it is. Yeah. Here it is. And they said, uh, every member of this church who has entered the waters of baptism has become a party to a sacred covenant. Mm-hmm. It's like boom okay right yeah. that's it eight year olds you you're now you promise, you promise. that's yeah. it yeah um, and they use it for everything they use it i've seen do. recently for missions you made that promise you don't even have to think or make a decision on going on a mission you promised that oh well, that was uh, Kevin or Pearson. Or like, marriage or, yeah exactly you're gonna pray about going on a mission <laughs> dumb question yeah. god's told his prophet to tell you yeah. to go yeah. so you should go stop waste it was almost like stop wasting god's time yeah. with silly questions it's like all right, Kevin, chill out. <laughs> Your life is totally laid out for you. It's yeah. completely prescribed. Yeah. You yeah, actually th don't have any agency, do you? <laughs> yeah. If I thought about that, I would have popped it in the, the chat. Yeah. Okay, so let's talk about, he was the one I think that actually pushed down on garments the most. Yes. Yes. Persons who have been endowed in a holy temple are responsible yep. to wear a temple garment, an article of clothing not visible because it is worn beneath our outer clothing. Fine. It reminds endowed members of the sacred covenants they have made and the blessings they have been promised in the holy temple um, to achieve those holy purposes. You know, referring to temple garment. Uh, that's a little note for myself there. Um, to achieve those holy purposes, we are instructed to wear temple garments continuously, uh, with the only exceptions being those obviously necessary. Because covenants do not take a day off, to remove yeah. one's garments can be understood yeah. as a disclaimer of the covenant responsibilities and blessings yeah. to which they relate. 
Yep. I definitely wrote that down. A disclaimer of the covenants. So mm -hmm. the day that you go to the gym and you don't quite put them back on, it's a complete disclaimer of all the covenants you've ever made. Pre-mortal life, baptism, everything. It's huge. So your own personal revelation that says, I feel good in yoga pants. No, that's out the window. Mm -hmm. So there we are. That was the uh, that was the Sunday morning session of conference. Did you have anything else on uh, on Oaks before we wrap up? Wow. No, I just think, you know, I just I we had garments at the beginning. We have garments at the end. I'm sure we'll hear it again because that's the big hot issue. And it definitely yeah. speaks to personal revelation that people I think ever since COVID, people were starting to talk about personal revelation. I heard faithful family members talk about personal revelation more during COVID than I ever had. And now yeah. it's with the garments. And I think, th I think there'll be more talks like this. They really have to stamp that out. Yeah. Well, to all 750 of you that have been watching, thank you very much, everyone, for watching. And I'll see you in about three hours for the final session of conference. Uh, I predict there's going to be 15 temples. But to find out where they're going to be, and if I'm right, make sure you tune in. Hit the notification bell for that. Hit the like button. If you want to come hang out with me in Scotland, uh and jane from 21st century saints and peter from mormon civil war they're all going to be in scotland thank you very much robin for the super sticker um then jump on thrivebeyondreligion.org and come meet us in scotland and uh, i'll see you in about three hours thank you very much rebecca do you want to have a quick plug of your your channel tell everyone where to go well i will and i will say that on mormonish podcast we are airing your episode the one we take with you about church finances on friday morning at 11 a.m. Mountain Time. So I'm not yeah. sure what time that would be on your side of the world, but it will be Friday morning. We're going to air your episode. 11 a.m. Mountain. So about 6 p.m. here. Yeah, so. perfect. See, perfect. Have some dinner. Watch Nemo again. He did. We had a really fun discussion, but uh, Mormonish podcast is pro every Tuesday night at 6 p.m. live. That's probably hard for, you know, more of your audience, yeah. but we have a lot of fun and we're excited to air our episode with you. So awesome. thank you for the opportunity. This has been really fun. I'm not My going pleasure. to watch the next session. I'm just going to refer to your recap. So go get Jammy Dodgers. That's I'm going to go try better. to see if the world market is open. I'm in yes. Utah. So. Awesome. Take care, everyone. All right. Thank Bye you, now. everybody. Thanks. Bye.